Welcome back, everyone, to AP Daily Practice Sessions. My name is Matt Pedlow. I teach in Chelsea High School up in Chelsea, Michigan. I'm going to go through four multiple choice questions of things that are often missed uh, on the AP exam. And we'll go through and kind of talk about why people miss uh, some of the answers, things like that. So question number one, based on the information in the graph below, what are the profit maximizing output quantities for a single price monopolist and for a monopolist that engages in perfect price discrimination. Now, before I even throw the answers on there, let's talk about what's important in this question. First of all, profit maximizing. This can also be described as loss minimizing, right? Same thing. And single price monopolist, so we know that's the kind of everyday monopoly graphs that we draw in class, where they're setting one price for all their consumers. But then what if they engage in perfect price discrimination? So then your brain, while you're taking this, will have to say, okay, perfect price discriminator is a firm who knows exactly how much the person is willing to pay, and then they charge them that exact amount. So let's look at the answers, okay? So here they are. Let's start with these single price monopolists, okay? Easy and micro because everything on these firm graphs comes down to MC equals MR. So if you go where your marginal cost crosses your marginal revenue, you're here at Q0. Now, the good news is, uh, you're kind of, you know, you have some different um, uh, options here, but you just eliminated C, right? No question about it. So you can remove that. And now you have uh, just the other ones that are on here, okay? Then you want to talk about a firm that engages in perfect price discrimination. So if you think about a firm that is engaging this, okay, they're going to charge this consumer right here. Let's say consumer one, it doesn't matter. They're going to charge them this much money. And then consumer two over here, you're gonna charge this much money. And then the third person and so on and so forth. So like Q1, they'll charge this much up here. In Q2, they're gonna charge this. Meaning as you move down that demand curve, each person entering the market, they're gonna charge them as much as they're willing to pay until they get right here. Now, where your marginal cost crosses your price. Remember, demand curves are price. They're average revenue, price, demand. And where that marginal cost crosses that, we call that allocative efficiency. That is the last consumer that they will sell to. They will not sell below that. So what happens? In a perfectly uh, price discriminating firm, your marginal revenue curve becomes your demand curve, okay? So I know some teachers say, Mr. joins the party is an easy way to think about that. And you go, so once again, guess what you're doing? Going where MC equals MR right out here at the Q3. So the idea for a perfect price discriminator they're gonna charge not just one price, all these prices until Q3, okay? At that quantity, they will stop. So the answer then obviously is B. Other thing to note on this, I know they didn't ask this, but we're gonna get a little bit in the weeds here for just a quick second. If they asked about the price with a single price monopoly and these dotted lines went all the way up to the demand and over, remember there is consumer surplus in a single price monopoly. If they ask about that for a perfect price discriminator and you made your dot lines over, there are, is no consumer surplus. There can't be consumer surplus if firms are charging you the maximum you're willing to pay and therefore it's all profit. That's just something to keep an eye on. Okay, let's go to question number two. Evergreen and each of you are bidding for a landscaping contract. The payoff matrix above shows or below in this case shows what each firm's total weekly profits from all its operations will be for each combination of bids. Now they've given you the information on here. Where, right, where it says like the first entry in each cell shows a profit, second entry in each cell. That's important, right? That the first circle in each box belongs to Evergreen and the second one belongs to Nature. And then they're going to ask you about a Nash equilibrium. All right, so let's look at the, remember, this could be a free response question very easily. It could also be a multiple choice. Matter of fact, it's probably going to be a multiple choice question or two. So when you look over the answers, before you do this, what you're going to want to do are, you're going to want to make your circles, which is what most teachers teach your kids. So the first thing you're going to do is say, if Evergreen bids high, what is Nature View going to do? Okay. Now, the easy way to do this is just kind of cover up these bottom two and say, if Evergreen bids high, if Nature View goes high, they get 300. If they go low, they get 400. So you go and circle the 400. And then say, if Evergreen bids low, if Nature View goes high, they get 100. If they go low, they get 200, lo and behold. Now you know that Nature View has something we call a dominant strategy. They are always going to bid low. So let's say, all right, but what would happen if Nature View actually went high? Now we want to figure out what Evergreen's going to do. So if they bid high, they get six. If they go low, they get 720. Clearly, that's better for them. But watch what they're doing here. 
So if Nature View bids low, if Evergreen goes high, they get 520. If they go low, they get 500. Clearly, they're going to get they're going to go low. And now what you found is what's known as a Nash equilibrium on this. Okay. And the reason for this is Nature View is always going to bid low. And because of that, Evergreen doesn't have a choice. They have to bid high because 520 is greater than 500. So when you're looking this one over, right? Evergreen bids high, Nature View bids low. Okay, so uh, the important thing to understand on here is dominant strategy, Nash equilibrium. In addition, in case you get another multiple choice or a free response question, use the numbers that you're given. So you might say, oh, the reason is uh, 520 is greater than 500, okay? Something like that. Or why does uh, Nature View? Because 400 is greater than 300, which is why they go low. All right, question number three. Pickle Co., a pickle producing firm, hires labor and capital. Ooh. So if you go back to unit one in micro and you remember utility and you start talking about uh, where you maximize uh, your consumption, right? And it's the margin utility of good X divided by the price of good X equals the margin utility of good Y divided by the price of good Y. Same idea, same concept between this. They're going to give you the numbers. If you know your formulas, it's just plugging in numbers at this point. So that's what's key with these questions. You have to be able to know your formulas. So they're going to give you the marginal product of labor, 100 units. So that means the last worker hired is going to produce 100 units. Marginal product of capital. So you're using a machine to do it. Last unit, 60 units. So if you look, here's the answers. Now, if you forget the formula, these answers are going to be very difficult. So if you think about the formula, it's the marginal product of labor over the wage or the price of labor equals the marginal product of capital. Yes, I know it's a K, but C has been taken. So they're using K over the price of capital. So if you plug these numbers into this, okay, we know 60 over 12 equals five, 100 over X, okay? 100 divided by uh, uh, X, the $20, right? Because this would equal five, you have to make this one equal five as well. So that's why it's $20. So in this case, know your formulas. Fairly easy if you don't forget that formula because the marginal product of labor divided by the wage you're willing to pay that labor. If it was the one thing you wanna look out for in this question, if the marginal product of labor over the wage was greater than the marginal product of capital divided by the price of capital, you use more labor, whichever number, same with utility, whichever number is higher, use more of that until diminishing returns or diminishing utility, okay? In this case, diminishing returns. And the final one, I told you it's a quick day. Public goods are underproduced in a competitive market because a free rider problem causes. I'll be honest with you, most of the time this question is asked, it is the idea that public or private firms are not willing to produce public goods. The question they wanna know is why? So if we look at the answers here and we go through them, sometimes in economics, instead of looking for the right answer, it's much easier in this course to cross out the wrong answers. So supply being perfectly elastic, price ceiling becoming binding, these have nothing to do with your free rider problems positive externalities, demand is perfectly inelastic, and you're left with C. Now, if you say, yeah, but I'm not really sure why C is correct. Usually the way this question has been written is it's because private firms can't prevent free riders, that, right? So they don't produce public goods. So the example of this is why, uh, why would the city you live in put up streetlights, right? Why doesn't a private firm? Well, if a private firm did it, they would make each homeowner pay them a rental fee to have light turned on. And I don't know about you, but why would I pay that if my neighbor would pay it for me and we could share the light? And there's no way they can't actually prevent light from hitting my lawn. Therefore, public goods do it. And so the idea of this is consumers don't reveal their true demand. I'm not going to let them know exactly how much I'd be willing to pay for this, right? And in all honesty, probably be zero. So then we end up with that free rider problem. Hopefully this helps all of you. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day.